Okay, I'm, I'm, my, I'm my own, um, what's the word, boss, <laughs> introducer today. So I have to tell you, they tell me I have to tell you, that apparently afterwards I'm going to go and sign some books. <laughs> they said, mention that at the end, but if I leave it till the end, I'll forget. <laughs> so I've told you now, so in case you're interested, you know. So, what, you are thinking, have camels got to do with anything? And the answer is, of course, not very much. But they are, I think, a nice example or of, of one of our curious attitudes to alien species, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. We have, we have this funny attitude. We have, we have this idea, this slightly dubious idea, in my opinion, that species, animals and plants, um, belong in some places and therefore do not belong in lots of other places. And we also have the even more dubious idea that if they get to places where they don't belong, normally because we put them there, it's our job to put them back where they do belong. Now, whether you believe all that or not, or especially if you do, you then have another problem, which is, where do species belong? Hence the title, where do camels belong? There's nothing special about camels, except that camels are a nice illustration of how that belonging question uh, can be a little bit awkward to answer. So, I promise not to say too much about camels in this talk, but I do have to mention camels, just in case there are, there are camel people in the audience who will be asking for their money back if I don't. So, camels, let's, let's just quickly talk about camels. Where do camels belong? If I ask you that question, one image will come into your mind. It'll be, it'll be a camel, no doubt, and in the background uh, will be a pyramid, and probably in the foreground a couple of blokes wearing tea towels. Okay? So, that's the first thing that will occur to you. If you but if you really know your camels, you might think of the other camel the Bactrian camel, the Asian camel, which isn't in the Middle East, North Africa, it's up in Asia somewhere. But if you really know your camels, if you're a real camel fancier, you might say South America. And this is a llama admiring Machu Picchu. That's your geographical key there. And in fact, there are six surviving species of llamas are just camels without humps okay they're, they're, they're camels there are six surviving species of camels in the world today two of them one here and one here and four in south america so if you're interested in where camels survive today south america is the obvious question where camels belong on the other hand if you really really know your camels you will know that camels evolved over 40 million years ago in North America and survived for a, an immense span of time in North America, radiating into a large number of species, large and small, and spread, in fact, only recently to Asia and to South America. And then, much, much more recently, only about 8,000 years ago, in fact, they died out in North America and now only survive in Asia and North Africa and in South, um, South America. And just to muddy the, the camel, the camely waters slightly more, the only place today where you can find the dromedaries, these things in North Africa, are now entirely domesticated. The only place you can find wild dromedaries now is Australia. where there are, is a large and thriving population of wild camels, because we took them there. So, there you are. That's practically the whole planet, apart from Antarctica. So make your mind up, where do camels belong? It's not a question with a simple answer. You can dream up a definition of belonging that will give you 
any or all of those. So the question of where a species or where a group of species belongs is not a simple one. Depends on your definition, depends when you look. However, that's enough about camels. That's the end of camels. Um, what we want to do now is focus in from this global camel-centric view of the world into, into and look at Britain. Look at our attitude to alien species. And what I'm going to try and convince you, where, by the way, where, by the way, there is no evidence that camels ever lived in Britain. <laughs> so even George Monbiot will not be wanting them to be reintroduced soon, anyway. So what's our attitude to alien species in Britain? I think I'm, it's fair to say that we don't like them. We don't like alien species. Actually, we don't mind them as long as they stay where they should be. But if they come here, in principle, in general, we don't like alien species. It's quite hard to put your finger on why we don't like them, in principle. It could be Japanese knotweed. It could be the Daily Mail. <laughs> or it could be that most toxic of combinations, Japanese knotweed and the Daily Mail. <laughs> In fact, there's some, there's some fantastic text here, actually. A race of female clones from the fiery volcanic wastelands of Japan. <laughs> no wonder people are frightened of Japanese knotweed. In fact, if, you're, if you believe half of what the Daily Mail says about Japanese knotweed, you very quickly enter a declining spiral of despair, <laughs> of debt, of destitution. <laughs> you think I'm making this up. And ultimately, of course, of course, death and suicide. <laughs> now, don't laugh. It's very sad. It's very sad that a bloke killed his wife and himself while the balance of his mind was upset by fear of Japanese knotweed. I have to say it's very sad. But on the other hand, it is, I think, to a large extent, tragically inevitable. So, we don't like alien species. It's easy to blame the Daily Mail. It's easy to blame the Daily Mail for almost anything, quite honestly. <laughs> Um, but that wouldn't be fair. The Daily, Mail, the Daily Mail are exploiting our fear of alien species and sometimes alien people as well. But they didn't create that fear. They didn't create that paranoia. That was there already to be exploited. Um, my favourite example of, 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 of this attitude or of satirising this attitude is my my very favourite Flanders and Swan song from the 1950s. <laughs> if, you've, if you've never heard this, it's, I mean, the text, just the plain text is wonderful, but as a song, it's, it's marvellous. I love it. I've, 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 out of respect for where we are, I have, I have omitted what they say about the Welsh. <laughs> um, Flanders and Swan, of course, are thoroughly tongue-in-cheek here. They are, they, are, they are thoroughly, you know, just taking the mickey out of our, our attitude to, to alien, aliens. In this case, alien people, but alien species is, is just the same. 
But that attitude was there to be satirized. They didn't create it any more than the Daily Mail did. It was there already. So, let's talk a little about our attitude to alien species. And before we do that, a little technical interlude about what I mean by alien and what I mean by native. Europe 20,000 years ago, the height of the last ice age, ice, all the way, this blue stuff is ice. And all this is land. Britain, thoroughly connected to and part of Europe. All this is land. The Channel is land, the North Sea is land. We're not an island. At the time, this little inset here shows down here, this is the North Sea, it's entirely dry. The Channel is one enormous river of which the Seine, the Thames and the Rhine are just tributaries. But it's dry, basically. The sea is right down here. So at that time, we share completely a land mass with Europe. We have all any European species which can live here, although it's very cold. So it's, this is just tundra. Later on, the ice begins to melt, the temperature begins to rise, and the modern plants and animals that we think of as British begin to flood back into Britain across the land bridge from Europe. About 8,000 years ago, this final land bridge here is finally submerged, and we become an island. And at that point, we have our native flora and fauna. Because from then onwards, from about 8,000 years ago, the, the possibility of anything else invading naturally from, from Europe or from anywhere else, virtually disappears. <laughs> so with apologies to Dad's army, from that point onwards, the Channel and the North Sea have protected us from most alien invaders ever since. Of course, lots and lots of things have come into Britain since then. But we have brought them. And if we brought them in, that means they're not native. So that's what I mean by native. That's the normal definition of native that most people agree with. Anything that got here on its own, without any human assistance, and that basically means before that land bridge was broken 8,000 years ago. Now and then, however, something turns up in Britain, and we don't know how it got here. And that throws us into a complete uh, state of paranoia and chaos. For example, this is one of my favorite examples here. This is a thing called Serapius parviflora, the small flowered tongue orchid, discovered in 1998 in a field near Ramehead in Cornwall. How did it get there? This is the crucial question. Orchids produce millions of tiny, tiny seeds. And this orchid is not uncommon across the channel. So it's perfectly possible that seeds of this orchid simply floated across in the air, landed here, germinated, and grew. In which case, in which case, this is, well, firstly, it's quite attractive. Secondly, it's by definition very rare. And therefore, worthy of any amount of protection we can throw at it. No doubt, a little fence around it to stop sheep eating it. Probably 24-7 volunteer team of wardens. Maybe its own biodiversity action plan, who knows. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, there's another possibility, which is that the seed fell out of someone's trouser turnips or was stuck on someone's shoe, in which case it was a human import, or worse still, it was planted by some mad botanist <laughs> who thought Cornwall needed a bit of brightening up. <laughs> In which case, it's valueless. It's just another bloody weed. It has no right to be here because that's our definition of native and alien. Notice, however, that whatever you think of 
those two possibilities, and we actually don't know which one of those is right. The plant is the same. The plant is the same. It's in the same place. It's doing mining its own business. It's just our attitude to it. So it can be very confusing. But this is a tiny minority of species. Mostly we know whether things were brought in by humans or not. So let's, let's look at some. Let's look at some aliens. Good old Rhododendron ponticum. Now, Rhododendron ponticum is really interesting because it's kind of public enemy number two. Nothing can beat Japanese knotweed. But, but close behind Japanese knotweed is Rhododendron ponticum. Now, I talked about glaciations a moment ago. We're in an interglacial at the moment. That's a relatively warm period between these long cold periods where most of the country is covered with ice. That's happened over and over and over and over again during the last two and a half, three million years in Britain. Every time that happened, when the ice melted and the temperature rose, we got, this, we got this invasion of species from Europe. But every time that happened, the species that came in from Europe were slightly different. We never got exactly the same mixture of European species in any of those interglacials. In the previous interglacial, we had Rhododendron ponticum. It was native. So if being here a long time ago is any guide, Rhododendron ponticum has more right to be in Britain than you do. <laughs> of course, Rhododendron ponticum is in fact a very unusual plant because what we're looking at here is not Rhododendron ponticum. It's been called by botanists who study it ponticum soup. Or, to give it its official name, Rhododendron superponticum. Because it's a hybrid of ponticum and at least two or three other North American species. It's not ponticum. Pure ponticum doesn't occur in Britain at all, as far as we know. So, the plant that we call ponticum, but really isn't, is a creature of our own creation. And you might say that that, therefore, has no right to be anywhere. It's not native anywhere. But if it is native anywhere, that place is here. Because it doesn't occur anywhere else on the planet. So Rhododendron ponticum is a hard plant to think about if you worry about nativeness and alienness. It's not unique, however. How about these two? This is a Zola, a water fern. And this is a mandarin duck. They have two things in common. It's illegal to allow either to escape into the wild in Britain. They are Wildlife, Wildlife and Countryside Act Schedule 9 species. It's a crime to allow either of these to release. In fact, Azola is one of five aquatic species which it was recently made illegal to sell. You cannot sell it. Both also like Rhododendron ponticum, were British natives in the previous interglacial. They were both here before you were. Which, if you think that's important, and it's up to you whether you do or not, makes them pretty good candidates for being British natives. It's just chance, pure chance, good chance, bad chance, who knows, just pure luck, that in this interglacial, Azola, Mandarin duck, Rhododendron and Ponticum are not British natives. In the previous interglacial, they were. Plus lots of other weird things. Elephants, for example. <laughs> what about these two? These are my two favorites. Now, for those of you whose lagomorph recognition is, is a tad patchy, this is a hare, and this is a rabbit. Native or alien? or don't care. In fact, the history of these two species in Britain is identical. They were, they were natives in the previous interglacial, before the present one. In this interglacial, both are human introductions from Europe. But, This one is practically a conservation icon. It has its own, very own biodiversity action plan. 
Huge sums of money are spent on managing countryside to make it good for hares. This one is a reviled and hated pest. But that has nothing to do with their alien and native status, as far as I could tell anyway. What about some plants now, which are definitely, genuinely alien? This lot. These are all aliens. They're all arable weeds. 99.9% .9 of Britain's arable weeds are aliens. And they must be aliens because the clue's in the name. Arable weeds. In the early part of the present interglacial, there was nowhere in Britain for plants like this to live. The country was completely covered with trees. It was one huge wood. So there were no arable fields. There were no large areas of open, disturbed ground for plants like this to live. These plants were brought in by early farmers by accident. Not on purpose, by accident. As contaminants of grain and soil and on clothes and on vehicles and whatever from, from Europe. So, no one disputes that. The fossil history, the recorded history of these plants is, is well known, well understood. They're all aliens. On the other hand, here's a problem. Some of these plants are very pretty. And some of them are rare. In fact, some of them are extremely rare. Some of them, damn it, are extremely rare and pretty. And we like plants that are rare and pretty. In fact, the rarer things are, the more we like them. What we really like is something that we catch just on the edge of going extinct. Those are the plants and animals we like best. And yet, they're all aliens, and we don't like aliens. So what do we do? It's enough to make your head explode, isn't it? What do we do? What do we do? Well, we do the British thing, which is we pretend they're native. So this is some publicity from the charity Plant Life, which is asking us for money to protect a whole bunch of arable weeds, our native arable weeds. And they're not, they're not native. No, everyone knows they're not native, they're aliens. I'm not, by the way, I'm not, by the way, uh, complaining about Plant Life. Plant Life, wonderful organization, I remember. They do lots of good things, but they do, like everyone else, have this blind spot where basically they think people cannot be persuaded to like a plant and to help to fund its conservation unless they think it's native. And if that means lying about its status, they're happy to do that. <laughs> this, is, this is quite old now, but this is, this is very recent. This is a new project from Q called Grow Wild, an exciting four-year campaign which began this year to bring people together to sow UK native, native wildflowers. Why UK native wildflowers? Why indeed? Nice picture here, because the picture's entirely of aliens. Q have decided, and in fact, they're handing out packets of seeds, and if you get one of these packets of seeds, the three plants that are shown in this picture, which is the corn poppy, the corn flower, the corn marigold, will be in there, and they're all aliens. They're all human introductions. So they've decided that we, if we are to be enthused about this project, about growing native uh, wildflowers, we cannot be trusted with the knowledge these plants are not native. We will then not like them, and we will then not be motivated to get the packets of seeds and actually sow them.
Now, what do people do when confronted? What do people do, like plant life or Q, if you say to them, but these plants are not native? What do they do? You get a number of responses. One is, the most common one, is simply to, to gaze into the middle distance, um, put your fingers in your ears, and hum, hum to yourself. <laughs> which, is, which is good, because you can't argue with someone who's doing that. In other, words, in other words, I hear what you're saying, but I don't care. Other more thoughtful people say, well, yeah, okay, all those arable weeds that I showed you are, um, they are aliens, I agree, but they have cultural significance. Cultural significance in British history. And they do, indeed. But then, but then so do dysentery and smallpox. <laughs> and we don't feel any great need to conserve them. In fact, those arable weeds, the clue's in the name again, arable weeds. They are weeds. They are, they are weeds. They are plants that interfere with growing crops. I come from a long, long line of, of peasants, and my peasant ancestors, their lives were made miserable by those plants before the invention of herbicides. Now we can, we can control those plants at the flick of a switch. We can say we want them, we don't want them, just by choosing what to spray them with. But before we had all those sprays, those plants were a real problem. They really did make growing cereals and other crops in this country difficult. Just think how wonderful it would be if we had managed never to bring all those weeds into Britain. You're all gardeners, I'm sure, many of you. Think how great it would be to have a garden without weeds, because they're nearly all human introductions from Europe. It's marvellous, really. it's paradise, isn't it? But we did bring them in, so now we have to conserve them. A third group of people, a third group of people say, ah, they say, what they would like to do is to get rid of the problem of all those arable weeds being aliens by introducing a simple residence test for nativeness. <laughs> okay, in other words, none of this human introduction alien, you know, otherwise native, none of this human, non-human, non none of this dichotomy, but simply a time. We set a time. If a species was in Britain before a certain date, however it got here, it's native. After that date, it's an alien. Now, if you go down that route, you may as well pick a number out of a hat, quite honestly, because it's up to you. I mean, there's no, there's no reason to choose any date over any other. But a popular date, for people who like that idea, is 1500, 1500 AD. In other words, if a plant was here before 1500, it's a native. No questions asked. It doesn't matter how it got here, it's native. Now, here's a tip. If you try to get rid of a difficult problem by moving the goalposts so that the problem simply no longer exists, don't. Because what nearly always happens is you create other problems that are even worse than the one you were trying to solve. So, for example, if we say 1500, if you were here before 1500, you're a native. That makes, for example, all Roman introductions native. All of them. Grapes. Figs. Mulberries. Pomegranates. These are all, at a stroke, native plants. And lots and lots of others. Can't be what they intended. I just, I don't think so. And they say, no, 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 that's not what we meant. We meant, what did, what did we mean? I know, I know what we meant. We meant, because you're in trouble now, so this is what happens when you're backed into a corner. What did we mean? I know what we meant. What we meant is, we meant, we meant, not, we meant not in Britain before 1500. We meant, we meant in the wild in Britain before 1500. That's what we meant. And grapes aren't in the wild. 
Grapes are only here because people grow them. Ah, see, gotcha. So, how does that work? Wild? Really? Wild? In Britain? Here are some wild poppies. Notice the wild place they're living. <laughs> it's a monoculture of an annual grass from Iraq. And that's wild. Where could be less wild? Can you think of anywhere less wild? In fact, if that's wild, if that's wild, where isn't wild? Chelsea Flower Show? <laughs> Centre Court? That's about it, really. If that's wild, everywhere's wild, and wild becomes meaningless. In fact, poppies are interesting. Poppies are interesting because botanists have looked carefully at poppies, the common corn poppy, the common Flanders poppy, and what they found is that it apparently is such a human camp follower that it does not have a wild habitat. Nowhere on Earth does it occur except in this kind of habitat. It doesn't appear to have a natural habitat at all. And here's the real problem. Even if we adopt the residence test, even if we move being native to 1500, if you're here before 1500, you're a native, even that wouldn't help these four. Even that. Now, when I was a lad, which admittedly is a while ago, we thought, actually, no, thought, thought's the wrong word. We knew that these four plants were British natives. And why did we know that? Because the standard British flora of the day, known to generations of botanists as CTW, Clapham, Tewton and Warburg, said they were native. And I'm personally contractually forbidden from disagreeing with that because Tom Tewton taught me taxonomy when I was an undergraduate at the University of Leicester. He's long dead now. We now know that Clapham, Tewton and Warburg were wrong. And that all four of these plants are aliens. Not only are they aliens, they are recent aliens. They are post-1500 introductions. Even Fritillaria meleagris, even the snake's head fritillary, a conservation icon, if ever there was one, is, trust me, a recent garden escape. That's all. Doesn't stop us conserving it. In fact, we, we just basically, the conservation establishment that looks after the meadows and things that this thing lives in, simply refuse to believe that it's not native. But it's not, trust me. So, I hope what I've done here is convince you a little that our idea of nativeness is a little bit iffy. Um, and that even, even when we think about the idea of nativeness, if we if we think we know what's native, we don't, we don't pay much attention to it. We actually tend to decide whether we like a plant or an animal, like we like hares, we don't like rabbits. And then, if we don't like something, we then decide that being alien is one of its crimes. But if we do like something, we tend not to add being alien to its list of misdemeanors. In fact, we tend to ignore the fact that it's alien at all. But if you're still attached to nativeness as a principle, let me just mention two other things. One is, ask yourself this. What do you think of these three? Three perfectly, perfectly good, perfectly legitimate British native 
animals. All of them not currently here because we killed them all. If you could vote tomorrow to have them back, all three of them, and remember, they've more right to be here than you have, would you? Or a more interesting question, how much trouble do you think we should go to to arrange the country so that these three not only could come back, but would be happy here? I think that's quite a nice test of your attitude to the value of nativeness. And the second, final thing I, point I want to make is we sometimes forget how completely dependent human civilization is, not just in Britain, but globally, on alien plants and animals. Practically everything we eat is an alien. Not just here, but everywhere. Just take a look at this. I know it's not lunchtime, but it soon will be. So just, just, just have a little drool over this. This is, this is a, a pub menu, lunchtime pub menu at, um, uh, from one of my favorite pubs. You don't need to know which pub. Now, it's busy enough without you lot turning up. <laughs> OK? Now, if I asked you to, um, to survive on this pub menu for a week or two, you wouldn't be very upset, would you? You wouldn't regard that as much of an imposition. In fact, some of you are looking very cheerful about the idea. I could see that. How happy would you be to survive for a week or two on the native version of this menu? What would that leave us with? Well, for example, let's start here. Sandwiches are out. Any sandwich is out because none of our cereals is native. They all come from the Middle East. So sandwiches are out. You can't have sandwiches. What have we got down here? Beef. Cows aren't native. Cows come from the Near East. None of our, none of our common root vegetables is native. Beer, for God's sake. Beer's not native. Hops are native, but barley isn't. So beer's not native. Time's not native. Nothing in onion is, is bread isn't native. Nothing in oni uh, onions are not native. There's nothing there that's native. It, you can't even have a glass of wine either, because grapes obviously aren't native. So that's no good. Eggs, eggs, no. Eggs, chickens, no. Jungle fowl, tropical, heavens, no chance. Uh, Beef again, no. Toma tomatoes, do me a favor. <laughs> Basil, parmesan, parmesan, no. You can't have, you can't have cheese, because that's cows again, so that's no good. This, this is just, this is just foreign muck. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's terrible. So, anyway, let's just stop. I, I could go on. We won't go through the whole menu line by line. Let's just, let's just, at this point, Let's just cut to the chase at this point and show you what you are allowed to eat from this menu. <laughs> Haddock? Yeah. Haddock. Haddock, there, an oak smoked haddock down here. Okay, you're allowed because they're coastal British fish. This is gammon steak. This is bacon pie. Now, pigs, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt with pigs. OK? Could go either way, pigs. Pigs, pigs are indeed a domesticated version of the wild boar, which is a native British animal. Another native British animal that isn't here because we killed them all, but it's a genuine native. The domestication of the wild boar into your modern domestic pig took place in Europe not in Britain. So you could argue that pigs are a, an alien European import, but I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be kind, because you'd, you'd be sick just of haddock, wouldn't you? <laughs> so I'm going to say, yep, yeah, you, you can keep 
you could keep the pig. Um, oh, cured bacon pie, yes, you could keep the bacon, but of course not the pie. <laughs> what are we left with here? Haddock, gammon, bacon, oak smoked haddock, chive blinis, chive blinis, you can, yeah, chive, yes, chive's a native, blinis, no. <laughs> blinis are made of buckwheat, buckwheat's not native, so the blinis have to go. So that's it, haddock, smoked or otherwise, things from pigs, chives, watercress. That's the native component of that menu. So remember, you want to lose some weight? <laughs> you heard it here first. The native diet, fish, ham, watercress. So, bon appétit, and thanks very much. And you're allowed to ask some questions, apparently. So, and the lady will give you a mic if you want to, then everyone can hear you. Um, thanks. Lovely talk. Um, you didn't mention grey squirrels. Somebody always mentions grey squirrels. <laughs> um, grey squirrels, certainly. I, 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 never, I never want to, on a serious note, I never want to make the point that all aliens are good. Because they're not. There are aliens that we don't like and we'll be better off without. And I have a strong suspicion that the grey squirrel is one of them, actually. So, personally, my garden would be a lot happier without grey squirrels eating the bird food, digging up the bulbs. And foresters would be happy without grey squirrels killing trees. So, but I think the point, the point grey squirrels, the point of that, that grey squirrels make very eloquently is that you need to be clear, if you don't like a species, why you don't like it. And I think with grey squirrels, the charge sheet is long and damning. So all I would say about grey squirrels is that one reason grey squirrels are very successful and reds are not so successful in Britain these days, there's the question of the pox that they carry as well. But one of the reasons is, of course, that we have changed the country completely from one which was completely wooded and red squirrels are much more arboreal animals. They're much more dependent on continuous woodland. We change the landscape into one which is much less dominated by trees, and grey squirrels like that more. So in a sense, apart from importing the damn things in the first place, we've only ourselves to blame for how successful they've been. Very interesting talk, thank you very much. I'd just like to go back to your, um, the beginning of the initial meltdown of this last interglacial period. Are you suggesting that from the receding ice revealing tundra in England and, and the English Channel, that trees won the race to populate that soil of England as opposed to almost every other seem to, you, you seem to be suggesting almost every other vegetation? No, they, they didn't. Um, it's, it's, it's clear that as the ice retreated and the temperature rose, clearly what was left behind by the retreating ice was a lot of bare ground. And there was a very brief phase during the recolonization of Britain from Europe when there was an advancing front of plants of open habitats. Grasses, docks, plantains, all kinds of stuff that now lives in grasslands and open habitats. It was very quickly followed by trees. Trees were right behind them. Like years, yeah, so we're talking, we're talking hundreds of years. Trees, even trees that you don't think might move very fast, things like oak trees. You give, you give an oak tree some jays, and squirrels and things to move the seeds, they can move at a terrific pace. 
So very quickly, the country was, was completely colonized by trees. But there was indeed an open phase beforehand. And it's possible, it's possible that some of those arable weeds were briefly present in Britain at the very start of the present interglacial, but very quickly went extinct. Because, because the trees then created a habitat in which they could no longer survive. about, we've mentioned the, the, the dreaded um, grey squirrel, what is your opinion about culling? I mean, uh, moles, all the, uh, the creatures which really can ruin our gardens. What do you have an opinion about that sort of thing? About, well... Well, not just moles, but anything which is really becoming over, over, well, over, you know. Well, the thing about all those animals is... Uh, you have to look at them all individually, I think. Um, I mean, grey squirrels, I've said, you know, I think grey squirrels are a problem. And anyone wants to shoot grey squirrels, you have my approval, go ahead. Um, or, or kill them in any other imaginative way you can think of. Um, it, I, I don't think, no, I think killing moles is, moles is fine. The method may be, the method, there may be legal or illegal methods, I don't know, but killing moles is certainly not, not illegal. And if they're annoying you in your garden, um, I always say the only certain cure for moles is, is to move to Ireland. Um, because they never got there. St. Patrick didn't just like, not like snakes, he didn't like moles either. Deer is interesting. Deer is interesting. We have, we have more deer than we've ever had. And, of course, the simple reason we have lots of deer is we have no deer predators. Now, the animal you want, quite honestly, if you don't like deer, is one of the three that I showed you in the picture there. And it's not actually the wolf. It's the lynx. The lynx is a deer specialist predator. And lynx... You know, there's a lot of argument about wolves. I don't know if, if you read George Monbiot's book, Feral, you know, he's obsessed with wolves. But, of course, wolves are always going to rub farmers up the wrong way because they do eat sheep. Lynx are deer specialists, and they live in woodland. They don't like open country favoured by sheep. So lynx are the animal you want. Form today. The Lynx Reintroduction Society. <laughs> And you, honestly, they're very secretive animals. You wouldn't know they were here. You would just suddenly notice there weren't as many deer. Badgers, badger culling, stupid idea. Everyone knows that. I, well, I think they do. Down here in the, in the far corner. I oh. was, I'm really sorry about this. Camels, how did they get to Asia? How did they get to Asia? I mean, across, across the Bering, Bering Land Bridge. Oh, I see. They didn't have to swim or walk on the ice or anything. <laughs> no. I, I had this image of sort of camels. I don't think swimming. camels are terribly good swimmers. Well, right. Um, no, they, for, for various times, you, if you look at the map of the world, you know, you could, see, you could see that Alaska and Russia are almost connected. There's a little chain of islands that almost joins them up. You've only got to lower the sea level a little and there's a land bridge appears. So they got across the Bering Land Bridge the way, the way people, people walked across the Bering Land Bridge. Uh, and not just camels either. Lots of other things went the same way. Horses. Horses evolved in North America and went across Bering Land Bridge to, to Asia. And again, like camels, they survived in Asia, died out in North America. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, you haven't mentioned one of the largest kingdoms, and that's fungi, who are, uh, and we're getting quite a lot of, in inverted commas, alien species coming in with global warming, probably. Yes, um, I agree. And there are certainly fungi we could do without. Um, and it's a pity that we don't try a little bit harder to keep ash dieback, phytophthora, and all these, all these other things out. But unfortunately, if you, have a, if you have an economy that values 
the lowest bid for something, which will often be a foreign grown tree rather than a native one, you're going to bring these things in. There's nothing you can do about that. So blame, blame capit you know, capitalism. On the other hand, the Fords are, are already blowing around, and I was thinking more of some of the other ones coming from southern Europe. <coughs> yes, yes. Well, as you say, they, fungi have an un unparalleled ability to travel long distances. I mean, I think, I think we would have got ash dieback anyway if we hadn't imported it. I mean, we imported it anyway. But if we hadn't, we would have got it in the end because, you know, it's across, it's across the North Sea, across the Channel, and the spores would get here. Uh, just following up that point um, briefly, w would you agree that with me, actually, that, that there should be a ban on tree imports to the UK um, other than the ones that are strictly quarantined, such as Kew and Western Bertha are, are setting up? Well... Yes and no. That would, that would go a long way towards preventing these tree diseases from invading. But I think, I think that a, a, the larger point to make is, that, is, is how difficult it is to keep all these invaders out, especially the less conspicuous ones, especially the fungi, the insects, which may be present just as eggs or as spores, you know, so the ornamental plant import trade in Britain, for example, is worth one billion pounds a year, right? Now, okay, you could quarantine all that and keep an eye on it until you saw whether it had anything on it that you didn't like. But that would involve building a greenhouse about the size of Herefordshire <laughs> and, you know, 10% of the country's workforce would then have to be employed to look after those plants until you decided whether we could keep them or not. And that's just ornamental plants. Then there's trees, then there's timber, then there's fresh fruit and veg, then there's just people who will bring in anything, you know, because people are stupid. You would, in fact, if you wanted to keep all these things out, I think you would have to ban international trade in anything um, except what? Something that had recently been very hot, like steel. You could move steel and probably plastic around the world. Anything else, and certainly people, would be forbidden. That's what you'd have to do. It's that difficult to keep everything out, honestly. The experience shows that. Experience shows that just really carefully inspecting things as they come in isn't good enough. Lots of stuff still would come in. Um, could you explain briefly, please, about the rhododendron ponticum? You say that it was a native of here. Yes. Um, was it reintroduced, or did it come from seeds that had lain low? As it no, it, it was a native in the previous interglacial, but that's a long time ago. And, you know, a lot of ice <laughs> covered the country since then. So, no, it's, it's, a, it's completely a reintroduction in this interglacial. We brought rhododendron ponticum in. And it's interesting that ponticum in Europe has two centers of distribution. One is around the Black Sea, which is the Pontic region, which is its name, ponticum. That tells you where it comes from. And it's also in Spain. Our ponticum comes from Spain, where it's endangered by climate change. Because you can imagine a plant that likes Western Scotland and Wales doesn't like Spain, obviously. Um, we brought it in. It was hybridized. It was, it was carefully selected by growers and nurserymen for hardiness in this country, but it's clear modern genetic analysis of what is now called ponticum shows that the plants that those early breeders and selectors were, were selecting were not pure ponticum. They, they had all these rhododendrons in cultivation in nurseries and so on, and the plants they were selecting looked like ponticum, 
but they were actually hybrids with other rhododendrons that happened to be growing nearby. In this case, oddly enough, American ones, even though most of our ornamental rhododendrons are, are Asian. And so the plant that was selected and finally improved to be, to be better and hardier w turns out to be a hybrid. Of, and there's two or three other North American rhododendrons in its makeup. So it's mostly Ponticum, but it's got all this other stuff mixed in with it as well. Uh, I was intrigued by your comment about the poppies only living in our fields. Yes. Um, uh, we've been making fields for, I don't know, 10,000 years. Do you, can you say anything about the history? I mean, is it a plant that's evolved, or was it living somewhere else, a habitat that we've now eradicated? Yes, it's it clearly, clearly that species must have had a natural habitat once upon a time before there were humans and fields. But what's happened is it seems at a very early stage of human agriculture, it moved, it found arable fields very much to its liking. And so it moved into arable fields and has adapted to arable fields because arable, arable weeds have really fast life cycles so they can evolve very quickly. Um, it's adapted to human cultivation over, as you say, at least 10,000 years. So now it's so perfectly adapted to arable fields that it, it doesn't any longer survive in whatever used to be its natural habitat. There's no, there's no natural habitat of, of Papaver rius ever been discovered anywhere. So we don't know exactly what it was. We can, we can kind of guess what it must have been like, but we don't know exactly what it was. Is there a, a native rhododendron? In Britain? Yes. No. No. There are European native rhododendrons in the Alps. Just, just two or three. Would there be any plant seeds that would survive an ice age and germinate once the warm conditions came back? <sighs> ice ages were very long. Tens of thousands of years. Even if, even if seeds were frozen in permafrost um, or under, under you know, a mile of ice, unlikely that seeds would, would survive that length of time. Not, I think, totally impossible, but almost. How are we doing? Someone? I don't know. Oh, it's yeah. on. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think you, you very elegantly illustrated a lot of our inconsistencies in the way we think about indigenous and native and dispersal mechanisms and so on. Um, what are your thoughts about the, as I understand, an introduction of lodgepole pine and Sitka spruce at the end of the First World War throughout a large part of Britain? Do you think we should uh, have a very active ed uh, eradication program now? Well, all I would say is that without, without going into the particulars of any, any actual individual species, I would, I would say that if you're, if you're interested in growing coniferous timber in Britain, you almost have to import an alien because we only have three native conifers in Britain, Scots pine, you and juniper that's it so if you want you know if you if you asked british foresters would they be happy growing nothing but scots pine they'd probably be horrified and i go back to this interglacial business in the previous interglacial norway spruce was a native fir was a native hemlock was a native so it's not as though these things are that remote, or some of them aren't. Of course, the North American ones are remote. I mean, they wouldn't ever have been native. So you can, you can say lodgepole pine is, 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 is not, you know, doesn't deserve to be here. But whether it should be actively eradicated is, is a different question. 
and, and, and a different question is whether the places lodgepole pine likes to grow should be a forested at all, is, is another question we could spend at least an hour talking about. Oh, and by the way, it is, it is, it is quarter past, which means it's an hour, and I, no one else can stop this because there's no one here. <laughs> so if we just decided to go on until lunchtime, they'd have to physically throw us out. But I think the organizers would probably, yeah, they're, they're nodding at me here. Yes, they're <laughs> nodding at me here. Right.